Are we alone? Uh, currently. Are we, we alone only in have the universe? Each other. Uh, in the universe? Maybe, maybe not. I'm clear. Okay, and when I asked you the question, are we alone, what did you understand by the word we? I understood humanity and maybe more broadly life on Earth. Because I guess if, I, if you were to ask humanity, I should have said, we're definitely not alone. We're surrounded by life, which we're currently exterminating. Are we alone in the universe as planet Earth with life on it? Uh, maybe, maybe not. We don't know. And uh, so humanity is kind of an ill-defined concept, I guess. Because if Neanderthals were still around, would they be or would they not be? Or chimpanzees, would they be? And I guess life can be, is also an ill-defined concept, or is it not? Yeah, it, yeah, it's, I suppose it is ill-defined, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's So this question is not well posed then? Yeah, you could say it's not well posed. And I, yeah, so that debate would maybe perhaps come down to something like, are viruses alive? Could you imagine viruses emerging on a planet in the absence of things we would call life, like bacteria or... You know, animals. Um, if I were not in this room, would you be alone? I think the question would need context for me to answer. Well, there'd be all kinds of life forms in here, the bacterial, for example, but the question is, would you consider yourself to be alone? Most people would answer yes. Yeah, they would answer yes. Yeah. And you wouldn't, or would you? I would answer, because I would fill in the, the blanks of the question, which is, normally, are there any other people in the room with you? <laughs> so a lot of people are only interested in finding intelligent aliens. And, uh, for example, if we found microbes on Mars, I asked them, would we still be alone if we found microbes on Mars? And yet, a lot of people would say yes. Would you be one of those? No, I'd say that is, no, you know, a kind of at a level that connects with, like, philosophy and religion to find microbes on Mars that really originated. If we could somehow demonstrate the, the result of chemistry and ultimately evolution that occurred on Mars, I think that would be a profound change to our perception of where we are in the universe, which should lead us to say, no, we are, we are not alone. Well, you, you're invoking the idea of independent origin of life, but if you're arising from the same molecules in the same solar system, is that independent? Yeah, it's independent. Well, if you could demonstrate that it was independent in a planetary sense, then I'd say, yeah, that would significantly increase the... But Mars and Earth are not independent, are they? No, because we have Martian meteorites, so we know that the two planets are connected and you know, perhaps maybe someone's on the calculation, the likelihood of finding a terrestrial meteorite on Mars. You know, so they are literally materially connected, if you know, gravitationally connected. We receive photons from Mars, we can see Mars. So we're connected in a whole number of ways. The question is how many of those are relevant for the emergence of life. And so clearly being able to see Mars in the sky doesn't presumably change the likelihood of or the ability for life to emerge from chemistry. But the transport of meteorites between the two planets is perhaps more significant. So it would be, yeah, it would be an open question still if we found life on Mars, which would be remarkable. We'd need to ask the question, well, does, it, yeah, does, it, does it look like Earth life in, it, in, in its fundamental chemical properties? Oliver, are you ever going to give me a straight answer about anything? Not on this topic, no. Okay. And is this an important question? Are we alone? It's as important as any questions humans care to ask of themselves, I think, yeah. What did I have for breakfast, yes, this morning? I Is think that as important as that? Yeah, potentially. It's kind of up to, up to you, yeah. I mean, I think what you had for breakfast yesterday probably, yeah, has more chance to affect you than the question, are we alone? But I think at a kind of societal scale, the question of are we alone has more kind of philosophical and theological implications than what you had for breakfast yesterday. What are the philosophical and theological implications of this question? I suppose hu human exceptionalism, um, which in any, any case, you know, arguably should be challenged by the plethora and ubiquity of life on Earth, which is non-human. <laughs> um, but So then it would have no implication because you've already solved that as not, humans are not exceptional. Yeah, but I mean, so that's maybe it was where the distinction between finding intelligent life versus any other kind of life. So maybe we, we could still maintain our exceptionalism if we did just find bacteria on Mars, even if they were demonstrably a result of evolution or chemistry that occurred on the early Mars. Whereas, yeah, if we did find, you know, people that would speak to us and ring us up on a phone that emerged separately, that would, that would maybe pose more of a challenge to, to theology. But I think even so, I mean, it would be a remarkable discovery to identify life on another planet.
I think some philosopher said an unexamined life is not worth living. So I'm wondering whether this search for trying to find your place in the universe is something that is uh, objectively important for all humans, or is it just this is a subjective judgment based on how much you want to know about yourself? I think it's subject subjective, yeah. I mean, if someone is is uninterested in it, then then that's fine. I can believe there are many people that ultimately don't are aren't interested in it. And possibly if you ask them, they're not certainly not interested in it to the extent they'd fund it to the level it possibly is funded already. So So you're not full with missionary zeal to try to convince such people that it is interesting? Well, I think it would be it's sad that those people are interested because I think the the universe is is more interesting when you look at it with wonder compared with indifference. So if education can uh, fill people with that wonder, then that's, it, that's fantastic. But you know, people's lives are diverse and varied and someone who has other things going on is possibly gonna be less interested in life and more interested in their immediate environment and its hardship. So it doesn't make you a better person for knowing more about your origins? I think how any given person responds to a kind of environmental stimulus, such as knowledge about the origins, is a very individualistic outcome. So could it make me a better person? Perhaps perhaps it would. But could it make someone else a worse person? Perhaps also. Well, are, are humans better than, let's say, chimpanzees because we wonder maybe more about this question? Yeah, I think better would need qualification in terms of better at what or in do I mean we're clearly better at the at than chimpanzees in doing particular things and particular tasks. Would you rather be a human or a chimpanzee? <laughs> I have no opinion. Really? You'd just as soon be a chimpanzee as a as a human? Yeah. I How about a dog as a human? Yeah. I, Worm? Well, bacteria, virus? Yeah, I honestly I really don't really you can care. Yeah. Really? So you have a what's that called? A zoological ap apathy, huh? Wow, okay, uh, so you're not somebody who believes in reincarnation then because I've heard that there's these levels in reincarnation of you get more and more like a human if you do good things and less and less like a human if you do bad things and you don't subscribe to that. No, I don't, I don't subscribe to that. Okay, do you think life is getting more complex as it evolves? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, I don't know enough about the quantification of complexity in, in living systems. I, maybe one way you could, maybe one way that's useful to think about it, that is life, in a sense, encodes information about its environment so that it's functional in the environment it's in. Are there more diverse environments on, on Earth now than there were in the past? Yes. Um, life has transformed the environment to be something it wouldn't be in an abiotic context. So and diverse so the is complex, you made a synonymy between diverse and complex. Random numbers are very diverse. Each yeah. one is different, so that, but very few people would say they're complex, but some people would. Yeah, I guess it, I, was, I define it in terms of information, con I suppose I sort of loosely seem to suggest it was something to do with information content mm -hmm. about the environment. And yeah. life now, the biosphere now has more information content in it about its environment than it has done in the past, I would imagine, because the environments themselves are more there are a greater number of environmental mm -hmm. types. If I gave you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat, you have to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? You know what, I would, yeah, I would just spend it on, on educating at university level. University level education, I've heard that if you spend, invest more money on primary and pre-primary education that's it's better spent. Yeah, I personally don't know how to spend that money though. So um, given if you've given me the money, if I immediately hand it off to someone that knows how to do primary and secondary education, then that would be absolving my... Not kindergarten. That not would be skipping. Yeah, but like, I guess the question is, you know, $100 billion is at the same time a lot of money and not a lot of money, I suppose. So if I was to, imp to improve the, the education systems globally, I don't know whether $100 billion would do it. But $100 billion means a lot in the, the more, the smaller sector of higher education. So you wouldn't invest in a telescope for, or a space telescope or something? No, because we're already doing that, so. You could do it much better, you do it, if you have more money, it would be, you could do twice as big, for example, and then see twice as many Earth-like planet atmospheres or something. Yeah, but I mean, 
they're really all that's doing is making something happen quicker that's going to, currently at least, the momentum is behind it happening anyway. Well, and primary education won't? Won't. Happen without the 100 billion that you're going to give it? Well, I think you could, yeah. I mean, I think the, the university education could be opened up to, to more people and there could be greater equity and access to it. And, you know, arguably the, the quality of it could also be in, improved. So I think that would, that would achieve something new, whereas funding a space telescope is, I mean, it's just doing kind of more, yeah, it's just trying to shrink the time scale. When I asked this to some people, they'd say, oh, we should invest in, tr if you're going to find out whether we're alone or not, you have to survive. And so you can ask, what, how could this 100 billion be used to it more to ensure our survival as a species? How do you think you could do that? Yeah, you could say so you could start a hundred billion dollar lobbying enterprise to get governments to address climate change. Lob <laughs> so you're in lobbyists. Give it to lobbyists. <laughs> okay. You would would you invest anything in, let's say, really good microscopes to see if there were nano aliens in this room? No. Because you don't think that's likely. Yeah, it's it's unlikely. I think it yeah. It just seems more, it just doesn't, yeah, it seems, if you've been given $100, $100 billion, that in a sense is humanity giving you a significant fraction of its productive capacity in some unit time. And I think you have more sort of responsibility in spending that money than to pursue something as indulgent as looking for nano aliens in a indulgent. room. Indulgent? Wow. Yeah. Like Christopher Columbus. He was quite indulged. Yeah, I mean, science is to some extent an indulgent activity. Oh. Yeah. Okay, how about, do you think, you know, your neurons in your brain right now, they probably, individual neurons, don't know that they're inside your head. They don't know that they're part of you. Could that be our case, that we, they're inside of an alien and we don't know it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I wonder what, yeah, I would wonder whether we're inside an alien computer or something than maybe a, a biological, what we'd identify so as a biological. Maybe we're living in a simu simulation. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, you look at, you know, you look at where simulation, you see it in the weather forecasts, you know, the, the models that, that allow us to predict weather run on the, the most advanced supercomputers we have. Um, and they're modeling a highly complex, chaotic system, yeah, which is governed by physical laws, but which in aggregate, the outcome of those, un, you know, those understood physical laws is extremely, extremely complex. And you create a system, a model system that's so, inherently unpredictable from the input that you create essentially a new universe which requires research to understand and you could fully under yeah you could completely imagine that the end point of that advancement is a whole sort of micro planet or universe which is a running simulation which is an attempt to understand the universe of, of the people who started the simulation but they've really all they've done in producing the perfect model is create another universe they need to start performing experiments on to begin to understand how it And then operates. simulation can make a simulation. Yeah. All the way down. Yeah. Keep them going. Okay. Um, I mean, in astrobiology, sometimes we use the following logic. We say, let's look at evolution and see if there's anything that has evolved more than once independently. And if that's the case, then those features become our best candidates for what we should expect life to evolve into elsewhere. What do you think of that logic? So looking at extant life and informing... Looking at extant life on Earth to see, has there been any feature of it that has evolved more than once oh, independently, okay. and then that somehow becomes a better candidate for what we should expect elsewhere. What do you think of that logic? Yeah. Uh, I think that logic is probably only as good as the environmental forcings that drove the convergence in the first place. Which environmental is Environmental forcings? Which I guess is to say that evolution comes up with solutions to the survival of the organism in the environment it happens to be in. And so it is, in a sense, not surprising that there's been convergence on Earth, or equally that there would be convergence you know, in other environments in which life has emerged if there's environmental commonalities there. Huh, so you think there might be environmental commonalities on Earth, which leads to convergence here, and those environmental commonalities might be shared by other planets? Yeah, you know, there are things which are a natural consequence of coalescing silicon, magnesium, oxygen, carbon in, in the kind of proportions you find them in galaxies, you get certain types, there's only, yeah, you always get certain types of things out of that, that mix. And so 
there's underlying um, there's universality to to environments. Um, All right. Now I, I asked you, are we alone? I think you said we're not sure. Now let's suppose that we aren't alone. Let's suppose that there's life elsewhere. How likely is it, do you think, for that life to involve human-like intelligence and make radio telescopes and spaceships, etc.? Yeah, I have no idea. How do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, so my, my preferred solution to that is that the act of interstellar travel is intrinsically difficult. And you can be in a very advanced civilization, and a light year is still a light year, and a light year is a long way. And yeah, well, if you live for a billion sure. years, it would be very easy to. Yeah. Well, we I, we don't know. I mean, you know, yeah, we don't we don't know how easy it is to solve that problem. It took life four billion years to emerge onto the continents. Mm. So, and that seems a small step compared to leaving your planet and leaving your star system and heading to another one. So it shouldn't perhaps be surprising. The universe is young in that respect. Four billion years to take a step onto land, is it surprising it should necessarily have been 10 billion years before we're taking steps between stars? Um, if we kill ourselves in World War Three or four or five or something and all humans are gone, do you think there will be, an, do you think there's such a thing as a human-like intelligence niche into which some other species will evolve, like chimpanzees in the movies Planet mm. of the Apes? Yeah, I, yeah, conceivably. I don't see why one species shouldn't again go down this perverse route of increasing brain size. And Do you think humans are trying to evolve into chimps? <laughs> because you just said, why couldn't chimps evolve into humans? So why not the reverse? Well, trying is maybe not the right word. I, I, I think mean, I don't humans think... would evolve into chimps then if the chimps went extinct. Yeah, it's an interesting question. What I mean, humans of culture and the development of culture allows kind of a partitioning of evolutionary innovation out from that which is coded in DNA into that which is coded in society or in culture. And that is an interesting relationship whereby the community can evolve culturally and be static um, in a kind of DNA evolutionary sense. And how that will play out, I, I don't know. Now, here's where I come. I'm going to stop talking to the rational Oliver and ask the emotional Oliver, what kind of aliens would you like to find? <laughs> favorite kind of alien? What would you really like to find? Uh, I, you know, I'd be, I'd be most happy with just some bacteria. You'd be most happy with just some bacteria? Yeah, I think that's a modest goal, but, you know, would I like to find intelligent life within the solar system? Uh, that would be, it would be kind of interesting, but it I'm talking be, to the emotional part of you here now, uh, right? The, your heart, not your brain, if you will, or your id, not your consciousness or something. I'm not sure. I think that's very deep. Um, well, you, you, I'm sure you have some emotions. I probably do. And I'm trying to talk to them. Yeah, I mean, it would be, I suppose, yeah, it would be nicest to find an intelligent intelligent alien species you could have a conversation with and they're terribly perfect and we could learn terribly how, perfect we could learn how to be a more functional race well, how about a how about a planet filled with the billions of oliver shortles <laughs> yeah i mean that would be bad for me right that's my unique <laughs> selling point completely gone there so <laughs> i think okay all right how about so you presumably wouldn't want a universe to be filled with aliens who are going to kill you. No, yeah, I think that would be on balance. And I guess you thing. don't need one filled with sexy aliens who are going to have sex with you or something. You don't need that either. That's not something that appeals to you. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't seem like really an essential So what thing. is it that appeals to you? Bacteria appeals to you more than any other type of alien? I, no one else has ever said that. They usually talk about cuddly things, friendly aliens, but you anyway. say bacteria. I feel like that's the, the 
alien life form, I feel like it would, yeah, I kind of don't trust us to, to not mess things up. And I feel like with a bacterial alien life form, there's like, a limited degree to which we could mess things up. So you're up. afraid of what you might do to aliens that are any more similar to us than a bacteria are. Yeah, I think we have not yeah. As we, long as they're bacteria, how you do them, what the hell you want with them, and they don't need to worry about it. But if it's like a little cat or something, oh, wait a minute, watch out. They're, they have their own planet, we can't mess with them. Yeah, I feel so like... They, my, it's like an ethics committee. Yeah, I feel like, <laughs> yeah, macroscopic life has a lot to fear from humanity, whereas... <laughs> So you're afraid of what humanity would do to it, therefore you want to emotionally protect not you, but the aliens, you want them to be back to it. That's a convoluted reason. But I think we'd, we'd still learn a lot about I'm sure the origin of life. I'm sure you would. And you wouldn't need to be feel guilty. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you have a favorite alien movie? I always watched Star Trek as a, as a kid, yeah. So, is this uh, Mr. St is this a Captain Kirk or is Captain Picard you're talking about? Picard, Picard, yeah. I grew up with Captain Kirk and you grew up with Captain Picard. You know, that shows, frankly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're definitely more of a Kirk character. <clears throat> it's that moral ambiguity. <laughs> well, I think, well, with uh, the new, with the Picard, it seemed like all the characters were the same. I couldn't tell the difference between any of the characters. They all had the same dialogue, same personalities. They're all politically correct and the guy had no... Anyway, that was... Wasn't it wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't it wonderful when men were men? Okay, have you ever seen a UFO? Uh, no. Ever been abducted by an alien? No. What do you know about aliens? I don't know anything about aliens. Arthur C. Clarke said any sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from magic. But there's a guy, Canadian guy named Schroeder, who said, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. Now, the SETI people, of course, hate that second alternative because if, if advanced civilizations all resemble nature, then there's no artificial signals coming from them that they could detect. Any ideas about this? Yeah, I mean, I don't like the distinction between us and nature. I think that's an artificial distinction. We are a product of of nature and we're doing in almost all respects what nature has done previously which is emerge onto a planet sort of carelessly exploit the resources and just live with the consequences so you think we're the entirely entire artificial natural is shouldn't be there yeah well i That's think a it's a form it's, of human exceptionalism i guess yeah i think we're we're in many respects natural which is not to say that we should act as amorally as we, we do, <laughs> with kind of carelessness that we do. They're looking for artificial signals, though. What can that mean if there's no difference? Well, yeah, what they mean is pi, signals... Pi, right? There's a pi. They mean signals created by intelligent life, which is artificial only in the sense that intelligent life is somehow distinct from unintelligent life that wouldn't build a radio antenna. But right. you know, radio antenna are a natural phenomena, okay. in the sense the universe is a natural phenomena, and you humans sit within it. So. You've seen the movie Contact. No, I haven't. Anyway, in the movie Contact, based on Carl Sagan's book, they have uh, they ask the leading character, "Are we alone?" And the the witty answer is, "Well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space." What do you think of that? I, I'm agnostic. If we're alone, then that's no more waste of space than having us in the universe in the space we occupy. So you don't think it's a witty emotional statement that you subscribe to? I appreciate the wit of this, the statement, but I, I don't really, it's not a waste of space to not have life any more than it's a waste of space to have life. Oh, so you appreciate the wit, but not the content of that statement. Huh? Yeah. Okay, are, are, do you think SETI researchers are looking for God? Mm, no, I think. Are they looking for artificial intelligences that are advanced, much more advanced than we can? They're, they know everything, they're omniscient. Well, maybe that is what they're looking for. I can't speak for them, but just looking for a radio signal is definitely not looking for God. And if you... Well, they're not looking for a radio signal from a, a worm. It's just a blah, 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 blah. But we send our radio signals and we're certainly not God, right? So... Maybe compared to some organisms we are. Okay. Um, what do you think are the public's or your students' uh, biggest misconceptions about the question, are we alone? 
Yeah, I can't speak for the public and their misconception or okay, lack thereof. Think? Or students. I don't know. I think people probably perceive the question in many respects as we all perceive the question. Okay, what do you think your idea. biggest misconceptions about this question are? Probably the thing I'm most likely to be wrong about is whether it's worth asking in the first place. Whether it's worth asking in the first place. So you think it is worth asking, but you might be wrong about that. You think you might be wrong. Yeah. So this thing, you think it might be a stupid question. Yeah, or an unsolvable question, given the technology or whatever will happen. Do you have a penchant for being interested in stupid questions? Yeah, I'm hard to, <laughs> hard to say. <laughs> I don't think I have the objectivity <laughs> to evaluate my own research career like okay. that. Do you have any advice for students or people who are thinking of becoming astrobiologists? I would say don't consider yourself an astrobiologist. Consider yourself a scientist investigating the universe with life as an emergent property of the universe and apparently at least one planet in it. Study the system and you're necessarily learning something about life in the process. What was, what's wrong with calling yourself an astrobiologist? Nothing's wrong as far as you maintain an open mind as to what is relevant for the question of life, its origins and its ubiquity. So. Okay, and do you think viruses are life forms? <laughs> I have no opinion about no that. No opinion? I have no opinion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, once more, are we alone in the universe? Maybe, maybe not.